Boom! All right, ladies and gentlemen, look, your health is your wealth. You got to take care of your body. Otherwise, everything else is irrelevant. But I know it's not the most exciting thing to do. But what if we could gamify it? That's what today's episode's about. Let's get this one going. Here we go. Shut up and sit down. Look, a business can give you everything you want in life. Prestige, wealth, freedom. It can also take everything away from you. This show is for those who are willing to take that risk. These are the real life stories of entrepreneurs. But before we start, I have one small favor to ask. Please leave a comment. It can be advice, critiques, tips, feedback, or share this with someone because your engagement is the most valuable and most powerful form of social currency. So thank you. And welcome to another episode of Business Boss. Today, we have a guest who has a deep-rooted passion for games and an unwavering commitment to health and fitness. He's the founder and CEO of Fix Health, a company that combines video game engagement and consumer marketing strategies to revolutionize corporate wellness. Uh, with his impressive background in game design and business development, our guest has played a pivotal role in guiding companies through significant growth and success, pun intended. Get ready to discover how he's using gamification to redefine health challenges and enhance employee well-being. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Mr. Mike Tinney. All right, Mike, it's on. Let's get this game going. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Let's do this. Health and wellness. I'm kind of a, a little bit of a health freak. I run uh, about six miles every morning. I do an intense workout. I know I am one of those ridiculous people that gets it done. Most people are not like that. How are you? Well, let me ask you, how did you get into this space? Tell me a little bit about your health and, and fitness background. Now, how are you helping people like make it fun? Sure. I love the question. And uh, I, I like any other company founder, I was trying to solve my own problem uh, first. Like I had this aspirational life goal of not having to buy larger pants year over year. <laughs> <laughs> and I was getting ready for a 10K, uh, and this would have probably been 13-ish years ago now. And um, it's just, I had done it before, and I was kind of an exercise active guy, but for whatever reason, this particular you know, five mile run was, was grinding on me. And, uh, when I go for runs, my head sort of goes into this open range think tanky sort of space. And I was like, well, what if I could get gratified now? What if my gratification loop was happening as I was running, as opposed to eight weeks from now, when I actually do the 10 K and check my time and see if I beat it from last year or whatever. So that was kind of the kernel. And then, um, I think like a lot of founders, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. what if I made a game that that made exercise easier to prioritize. So what it essentially was is not a better mousetrap for what to do, but a stronger kind of why. Like how do I change the prioritization of making this habit a regular thing? And that's really what the, the, the hook that I, I sunk my teeth into to try to uh, crack the code. Yeah, man, at the end of the day, when it comes to working out, motivation is the one thing we all are looking for, and it's the one thing that's lacking. Nobody gets up in the morning and is like, yes, I'm ready to go work out. It's like, oh, man, I got to get this thing started. How do I do this? You're but using are selling, They're selling workout plans. Like that, That's your content that's available right now. The, the stuff that's available is what to do. But there's so much information out there on what to do for both exercise and nutrition. It almost – like. It almost doesn't matter. The problem isn't having the most optimal version of what to do. The problem is being willing to do it and being willing to do it in front of your Netflix show or whatever. So it's that's that's the that's the missing gap for ninety five percent of people. You're one of the five percent that meets probably the Department of Health standards, but the five the ninety five percent just can't consistently be that active. 
Oh, you're exactly right. You go to any gym and it's covered with a bunch of TVs. Why? Because we're all trying to do something other than the one thing we're in there to do. We're trying to distract our minds from it so we can just get through the motions. I've seen a lot of stuff come out nowadays where you got Peloton, for example. That's an interactive experience. I've seen a couple of different ab uh, uh, workout equipment where you p- drop your phone in there. You can watch TikToks right there while you're doing some ab work. Like the gamification is so important because it kind of tricks our mind into doing something fun that is actually doing something positive to our bodies. So walk me through Fix Health. Where so you have this idea in your mind and you can't get it out of your head like every entrepreneur, right? You start thinking about it, dreaming about it, you're on the crap or thinking about it, just can't get it out of your mind. What happens? Well, I think you need two two or three things to to start an idea like this. You've got to be You've got to have the idea and you've got to be just it has to be gnawing away at you and then you have to have some combination of ambition or low ability to predict how hard it's actually going to be so you so you start it and go after it because i think if you asked any entrepreneur if they knew you know five years after they started their company what they knew before they started and looked at just the hard times would they have actually gone for it and and i think you get different answers you probably get a lot of bravado but i think in those truthy moments of the night you might also get like yeah i had no idea that i was going to have to do x y or z or that it was going to cost this much you know relationship capital or whatever whatever trade-off that was in that person's you know journey that they had to make but uh for for us i mean i always begin my games with the with the question of like what is the core behavior that you want someone to do Like, what is it that you really try to hack away at? And for me, it was just doing the same thing tomorrow that you did today, that you did yesterday. And and so the meta of that means that in the instance of the experience, you have to have at least some properties of of a good game. So there has to be a sense of progress and escalation, um, unexpectedness or an unexpected reward or surprise, uh, part of the feedback loop. Um, this particular game, because of what it was trying to do, which is gamify an exercise habit, it had to have like a social component, uh, a sense of people are there for me, but I'm also there for them. So social currency became something we, we pulled in and, and, and brought into the game. Um, we didn't make skill, player skill, a big part of it. So player skill is, you know, yeah, and you play Xbox or PlayStation. Yeah, I used to uh, own a game truck. I used to play a lot of video games <laughs> back in the day. So you're in the middle of a game and you hit the super killer level and you can't finish it. So you set it down for the day and that day becomes a week and that week becomes a month. And all of a sudden your player skills have atrophied and you can't play the game at the level that you couldn't beat before. And you definitely can't beat it now. So, so we took player skill development off of the table because we wanted this to be a horse that was easy for people to get back on. So your, your, your player skill level is really light. But the main meta of the game experience is the sense of, of progress that you make in the application that you have to fuel with your real world activity. So your real world activity is your game fuel. And it's a two currency system for those people that are into games. Uh, that means that your steps do one thing and your exercise minutes do another. And they complement each other, but they don't do the same thing. So you have these two different point totals that you're kind of balancing and strategizing how you're going to use but uh yeah that i mean the core is the real game is played in the real world and then the app gives you the that dopamine hit of oh i just made progress oh i just got to this milestone oh i just unlocked this or i got these new clothes for my character or i got this reward or i've advanced to the next chapter of the story Uh, so we we built a lot of those things in but we wanted it to be a uh, mostly a, a game that anybody could pick up at any time and just move forward with. So walk me through the, the user experience. Well, well, let's start with this. Where is the, where, where can we find this? Is it direct to consumer? Are you doing this for yeah. specific uh, groups and companies? How does that social interaction kind of come into play? Sure. We, we are, first of all, it's in the app store under the outbreak challenge uh, or a step ahead challenge. It has two faces. It has a, a, a consumer face called the outbreak challenge. And spoiler alert, alert, there's a, a free daily play. So if you go in and, and open up your ticket window and type in uh, free play, you get a free game of the day where you're just chewing away at the event and, and fighting 
most of our events are zombie based, but there's some killer robots and stuff out there too. Uh, right. But uh, you, you know, you're kind of going through the board and playing it, and you need your steps and exercise to advance past the level. Um, the bread and butter of the company, however, is corporate health and wellness. And we came of age during the Affordable Care Act, where corporate health and uh, and well-being was a uh, expected to be a bigger focus to the U.S. healthcare system. And I would just say, as a guy who's been selling into that system now for about 10 years, it's a system that's pretty resilient to change and disruption. But <laughs> we we produced this thinking that there was going to be a bigger appetite for wellness. And a lot of companies do enjoy and invest in wellness for their employees. I don't want to take anything away from that. But uh, I will say that uh, our, our main bread and butter is providing wellness services. So an HR person finds us either through a broker or through their own research or through our marketing material or through a podcast like this and and uh, not like this. There are no other podcasts like this, but through, you know, <laughs> social media or, or what have you. And they uh, they self-identify that this would be a disruptive and cool thing to do for their company and HR by virtue of the role that they play, they don't get to do a lot of cool things for the company. So we're we're a nice breath of fresh air. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, and let me tell you because a lot of times, especially in the insurance space, things are getting more and more and more expensive. Insurance companies are looking for ways to cut down costs, and one of the ways to do that is to have preventative things in place so that people aren't having to go to the doctor as often totally helps out with HR because then all of a sudden you can lower the cost of your group care if you have some of these preventative measures in place. Um, mm -hmm. I, at least that's my kind of understanding of how, how this stuff works. Uh, when you're approaching some of these companies, what's the what's some of the pushback that you might be getting that stops them from kind of implementing something like this? Because it's only beneficial to the employees. Yeah. I, can, can I go back to something else you said for a minute because yeah. I'm a little triggered by it? Um, the employer has absolutely a financial incentive in both insurance cost reduction and improved employee health, which results in higher levels of productivity and, uh, and, and lower levels of absenteeism, presenteeism, stuff like that. But the insurance company actually, for the most part, monetizes uh, health response, not, not problem prevent prevention. And they have, the industry has no capability of attaching any sort of reliable ROI on health prevention. Um, they will a lot of times give a company wellness dollars that they can invest on their own. And many insurance companies offer a basic platform that tracks employees' health. But these are all kind of end up falling into this chore category in most people's minds. So adoption is low, people don't take it up. And nobody, everybody knows the hamburger is not healthy for you. That's not why we eat it. We eat it because it tastes good and we feel like we deserve it. But That's right. uh, the, so, I think that the insurance system is designed in this country to monetize and profit from the response to health problems. And you can see it in our trend line. Like we just, our, our obesity and diabetes rates, you know, climb every year. Uh, the American Society of Pediatric, Pediatri Pediatricians just released this jaw-dropping report lowering the age of obesity response to children from ages six to two. So uh, it's, it's crazy what's happening with our behaviorally related health problems, but I don't think the insurance companies are positioned to solve it. Uh, fair, fair. And, and uh, they, they want to maintain uh, as many patients as possible, I guess. So we, it, it could work on the other side, but you're absolutely right, at least from the employer side. There's so many added benefits to having these people on a program like this. Yes, and 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 there there absolutely are. So an employer will often discover or find us. Now we do physical activity interventions in the form of a walking and exercise challenge, uh, and it runs on a, a standalone app on your phone that you install, and it talks to your phone step counter and things like that to get data. But um, the the resistance we get, if if any, is usually, um, I'll just say one of uh, the path of least resistance. So if, if an employer has a step counting program available through an existing health platform or their insurer or whatever, a lot of times we'll get the question, why should we, why should we hire your company to provide a, a step program 
that we can just get for free. And so we don't usually close those sales. We'll leave them with our data, which is we have a 94.4% completion rate. It's the highest in the industry. We take employees through a six week program that gets them up to 150 active exercise minutes a week. And so if an employee completes that program, they've, they've done the work. And six weeks is long enough for people to lose weight and build some habits. And uh, most of our customers now do these things two or three or four times a year uh, as organized events inside their company. So but, when people are using your, your app, it's in like a six-week phase or they can continue going on to the program day after day, year after year? Yeah, they can roll past those six weeks, but everything happens in kind of a story format. So think of it like a season on Netflix or something. You're gonna, you eventually finish the show or the season and then you'll be able to decide if you want to do the next one or not. And it's, it's designed in that sort of episodic format because our biggest, um, the, the, the highest percentage of people that need or benefit from these services are a, a personality archetype that we call the reluctant adopter. So this is somebody that maybe doesn't climb the stairs as fast as they did in college and they know it. Uh, they, they feel like they should be doing this, but they're really, at least at the start, looking for excuses not to do it. They're looking for reasons to say, well, it's not compatible with my phone or I don't have the time or it's, it's too much of a commitment or whatever. So we've gone through these painstaking iterations to sand down all these rough edges and make the app as easy as possible for people to download and start up and try. And one of those components is it's just six weeks. Like you're going to go through this first adventure in a month and a half, and you're going to escape the city that's overrun by zombies. You're going to get to the fortress in the mountains that, that's a safe place with the other survivors, and your story is done. And now you can do another one, and we have a really good return rate, but we wouldn't get a lot of those reluctant, reluctant adopters in if we coax them in on the premise like, this is going to start and never stop, and you'll, mm. never, you'll never be done. And we can't start people. No, no, you got to give them that end goal. And, you know, the cool thing is that you have a lot of key metrics that are built in as well as things that you're looking at from from like an entrepreneur standpoint. You're, you're developing as a gamer, a developing an app, you're a business owner. Of course, you're going to look at the metrics and try to improve things. But what about getting feedback from the people who are actually playing the game? How do they read the metrics? How do they kind of look at how it's helping them improve? And how can they give feedback if there is any to give to help improve their overall uh, performance? So in, in game design, there's two types of feedback. There's what people want you to do and the reason they want you to do it. And it's the second one that you need to pay close attention to because the first one is usually all over the place. But um, so we did survey people, uh, but we also watched the metrics. We watched, you know, how often did they log in? Uh, how many step, steps did they kind of bank up before they came in? What were their uh, ripcord or quit moments? And there were a lot of lessons in there for us. And again, our first version of the game allowed you to play very aggressively as a zombie if you wanted to. So it was a zombie outbreak style game. And you, if you got caught by the zombies, you'd be turned into a zombie. And then you'd chase other people as zombies. And we had a... Uh, a, a, a client that had a lot of my former coworkers in called Riot Games. They make a, a game called League of Legends. And they did what every game designer wants, wants someone to do. They broke my game. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the engineers got together and looked at how the game was designed and decided to sandbag and turn into zombies. They took over the zombie board and then they went on a rampage and just like ate their way through the entire company. <laughs> and, uh, and what we learned in that was a bunch of stuff. But one of the key takeaways from the game design point of view was, hey, some people want to play as zombies and, and kind of grief or harass their coworkers. But when that play style results in somebody else feeling uh, like their agency has been taken away and they've been disempowered and now they have to play the game in what they perceive to be a failure state, then that's no good. Now we're losing somebody who actually needs our help and is has been looking to us for motivation and we've done the exact opposite of that. So we had to we had to retool how we how we fit the zombie human conflict PvP part together. And it's a lot softer now, but um, it's still there. You can still 
do that. And usually the people that want to do that don't seem, they don't seem to miss the extra parts that the, the riot team exploited. No, I, I, that's, that's a great story too, by the way, because at the end of the day, when you start getting into any of the physical things, there is a sense of competitiveness that kind of goes into it, which kind of fuels you to go, to move forward. I know me personally, I write all my stuff down every time I do sets, how many I do, and I can look back and I'm like, oh, I could do better because I'm literally looking at my data from before saying I can improve here. And when I'm playing with other people, that kind of gives me a little bit more of a push. I know when I'm running and when I run early in the morning, nobody's awake, nobody sees me. But when I run in the afternoon or something later in the day, eyes are on me. And when eyes are on me, I feel like I have to be a little bit more competitive. And I, I can I can understand why they would run through as zombies and just dominate the entire space. But it does take away from other people who are on there. But how do you help kind of push the people who want to do that right some people just want that competitive edge and you kind of you kind of adjusted it so that the bottom end doesn't get defeated but how do you keep the top end kind of keep you know excited as well you did you already you already answered your question you guys push yourselves <laughs> your, your content your content for everybody else like you're the you're the fast mover person that's going to be out in front uh, if you're on a team you're going to be pushing the rest of your team and you're not you're very welcome to play my game and i want you in it but you're not the people that need it yeah fair enough fair enough um gameplay i want to kind of ask about that uh mm -hmm. zombie apocalypse you kind of talked a little bit about that sets uh is this something and, and you also said it's peer-to-peer -peer, so we're we're ta we're competing and, and playing the game with other people in this space uh is it like a a, a team type situation where maybe like you know, I'm in San Diego, maybe San Diego office against Orange County office. Uh, is it that kind of interactive where you can have teams that, are, that work together? Or are you kind of a lone wolf in here playing amongst other, other live people? It's on the corporate side, it's always teams. So social currency is a huge part of the game. And there was a research, uh, a researcher who I saw present, and I later tracked down his paper at a, at a conference when I was first starting out Fix Health. And he went through this, this long, presentation on his research, but the, the, the net thing that he determined in his research is that people, human beings, put forth three times the effort to avoid letting someone else down, two times the effort to try to beat someone else, and a baseline effort when they're just going at it alone. So yes, the competitive part matters, but not as much as the social obligation to help keep your team safe from the zombies and help keep your team ahead of other teams when possible. And so one of our challenges is a bunch of teams, three to 10 players per team in a foot race that is six one week races. So at the end of each week, you reach a safe house. You're being chased by zombies or robots or aliens and they're setting the baseline step goal. And then you're competing against other teams to try to reach the safe house first. And then uh, on the little game board, your team is lined up in a row and whichever one of you spent the most steps on your team is at the head of that row and then and counts back. So every element of the event or the game is designed to give you visual and interactive feedback on how you're doing relative to your teammates, how your team is doing relative to the other teams and how all of your teams are doing relative to whatever, you know, whatever the monster apocalypse is that your, that your group is going through. And what size companies uh, is this kind of beneficial for? So we're we looking for, you know, companies that have, you know, five plus employees. What, what kind of organizations would best benefit from something like this? So we, we, are, we are one of the only companies in the wellness space that go downstream to the sub 500 market. And we go to the sub 100 market as well. Uh, now, we do have some employers uh, who are annual recurring customers in the 10,000 plus lives uh, category, and they're absolutely wonderful to work with. But nobody in the space really pays attention to the sub 100 employer markets, and they employ about half of the Americans, like half of the Americans work for smaller companies. Uh, so you have this huge section of the population that, that would benefit from an employer driven health program that there's just no products for. And the other half of that equation is most hundred person or smaller companies don't really have, um, a lot of them don't have dedicated HR. It's their, it's their CFO who's running payroll or their controller. 
there's no marketing or market research to support the wellness journey for employees in that size. So it, a lot of them don't even know that they should be thinking about this for their employees. So we're, we have a, a dirt simple turnkey online platform where you know, your head of accounting, whoever runs payroll can just go in, buy the number of tickets you want for an event, swipe your credit card. Our system runs everything in the background. You never have to talk to us because we, we cost more than our robots do. And uh, you can just run it on your own on the cheap. Now that makes it easy, right? I mean, at the end of the day, what, what you're trying to do here is trying to get rid of as many roadblocks as possible so people can operate and, and, and utilize this to, to, for their company's benefits, for their employee benefits overall, make it as frictionless as possible. So if people do want to reach out and they want to get started, what's that process like? Uh, you can go to our website and click through to the, to the program site. And there's a little, there's a page on there that helps you identify if, if you are a good fit for our consulting services, or if you're, can I swear on this show? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Enough of a badass where you can just, you know, run it on your own through our website. So uh, we have a, a lot of business just goes through our website. We have a customer support team behind the scenes that answers, you know, tickets on email and, and stuff like that. But but that site is a really well trodden path now. We've been working on it since 2018, and uh, it's a it's a quick and easy way to set it up. And it, everything is handled. You just you get an email to forward to your employees. That email has all of the registration information on it. The program is created on our servers. When you click through that email onto the app, it takes you to the app store. It takes you from the app store into the app, and from the app onto your provisioned. Uh, challenge on the server so it's just you and your team alone as long as you use that link and if not then we give you you know alternative paths as well now with the world well i should say technology changing as fast as it is as we enter into the metaverse augmented reality we enter ai platforms i feel like everything's going to start changing how do you feel you're set up today and where do you see the company in the next few years as, as things continue to develop so I, I feel we're set up fine. We're a Unity-based application, and Unity regularly updates the software, and we, we tag along with that process to keep it current. Uh, we're probably the only health uh, wellness industry that has a full-time artist and animator on staff. So we're constantly building new adventures and levels and, and whatnot. But the, the tech is pretty baked at this point. We've been, we prototyped it in 2016. We rebuilt it in 2018. And, and we've been refining it and updating it through, you know, three to five updates a year. Uh, and it does everything we want it to do. And so now it's just a matter of making sure that, you know, if some hot new wearable comes out that starts to disrupt Fitbit and, and the Apple Watch and stuff like that, we can integrate with that. Uh, but from a business standpoint, I'd love to make our program available to other wellness providers that just don't have the same engagement rate for their physical uh, you know, intervention for that, that activity component that, you know, maybe their product checks the box on, but they're not getting 95% of their users to complete the program. Do you think there'll be a possibility for like a cross-platform type thing later down the road? I know Xbox, for example, had hit its old thing trying to get you to move physically. Nintendo had its Wii option trying to get things to move physically, people to move physically. Um, and then recently over the last few years, a lot of a lot has gone into cross-platform stuff thanks to games like Fortnite, where you're able to play across multiple platforms with different different peeps. I know right now you're talking about this being on your phone, but do you see it being something that could cross those types of platforms, hit different age groups uh, at a different level? Um, well, I don't know what I don't know, but I would say my my guess right now is, you know, your your phone is for most people, how, how we track your steps. Uh, so it's the perfect platform for our game because that's where, that's where your mobility data comes from. Um, so if we were to do an Xbox version, it would almost, I think as a game designer, need to be a different game, maybe a companion game set in the same IP, and maybe it's more of an exercise focused game that's using you know, motion sensing or VR or whatever. But, 
the form factor of the phone with the intent of the of the current bill which is we want you to be more active the lowest barrier entry is essentially just walking and we're going to talk to you in the same place that you used to be talked to all the time which is your phone so when when the zombies are close you're going to get a push notification the same place you get every other thing that you're supposed to be doing in your life is coming through on that same device it's talking to you in the same tone that you're used to being talked to and like that's that's where this game should live uh, whether it becomes part of an IoT or a companion to some sort of Peloton thing where, you know, company XYZ has this mega platform that captures all of it and they want to get health data on mobility from our game, that's sure a, a possibility. But I'm not sure how we would take our walking game and put it onto a, a static device that doesn't come with you. Keep it as simple as possible. What's working? Keep it working. I was curious because uh, my daughter also has this, uh, I forgot the name of the product, but basically this orange sock or yellow soccer ball. And she mm-hmm. puts her cell phone up and it tracks her movement. It'll tell her to like, you know, move the ball left and right, left and right. And it, it's kind of the same process, right? How do we get people to have that end goal? That end goal in this case for her, it's learn more about soccer and have her moving the ball the way she needs to. In your case, it's let's getting people up and walking, sticking to the simplicity of the action that you want. We'll probably get you the best result that you're looking for. So, Mike, I, I know I know we've mentioned it throughout the show, but one more time before we head out, if people want to get more information, where can they do that? They can go to fix-health.com, and uh, that's the portal, fix-health.com. All right, ladies and gents, that's it. Look, you got to get up and move, and you don't got to be as crazy as I do, but you do got to get up and move, and why not use a fun way to track that stuff? I don't know about you guys, but running from zombies, aliens, and what was the other thing, Mike? Robots. Robots. Robots, Robots. right? Terminator style. That'll get you up and moving at least a little bit. So, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you guys check that out. Go to fix-health.com, fix-health.com. Mike's there ready to help you guys out, get you up, get you moving, and get you in better health. Mike, thank you very much for being on the show today. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace. And we're out. It's over. Go home. Is your business in need of marketing? Try starting a podcast. But not just any podcast. Podcast like a pro. We can show you how to take your business from being invisible to becoming a brand people trust. Go to www.businessbros.com.